Whoosh. The cab shuts its door. There is me. There is her. And then there is India. Filth and piss and holy cow. Stop this rickshaw right damn now. This heat is giving me a heart attack. I just swallowed a whole spice rack. Madam, madam, it's no problem. Bowel movement. We can solve them. Buddha, Gandhi, Taj Mahal. How the hell do you see it all? Muslim Sikhs and monks in shock. You think they want me to put on my top? Bodies burning in a pile by the river. I'm about to bang this bra till I make her quiver. <laughs> this is India, people. It doesn't allow you any warm-up time. You need to grab that bitch by all six yards of her sari and hold on for dear life or else she will thrash you around her muddy streets and leave you in a trash-filled alley where the pigs will eat your carcass. <laughs> the slow meandering, getting to know you course that a normal relationship would take is replaced by our maddening race to the Taj Mahal in the hands of a bleary-eyed driver named Shoelace. <laughs> Within our first 24 hours of meeting, the girl and I had already hijacked a rickshaw, catwalked along the pipe of an open sewer, and saved a woman when she slipped on a mango peel and fell at our feet. We also ravaged each other in a sexual feast so desperate it made the movie Nine and a Half Weeks look like a Disney flick. <laughs> she was writhing and screaming and spasming, and then she kicked me in the vagina. <laughs> This is different, I thought. <laughs> and then I realized that all her fussing and panting was the result of a debilitating calf cramp brought on by India's severe hot dehydration. <laughs> oh, India, how you mock me. <laughs> she, too, was fast introduced to my idiosyncrasies, like my habit of neurotically counting my belongings before leaving the house or of applying my face lotion pour by pour by pour. <laughs> And the night before visiting the Taj Mahal, she learned that I am obsessively punctual. How fast can you have an orgasm, I asked. Oh, well, what, uh, 10 minutes, she stammered. Well, you got seven, because we need four hours of sleep before the cat picks us up at 4.30 so that we're at the Taj at five, because sunrise is at 5.02. Seven minutes later, I learned that she is incredibly efficient. <laughs> Later, we both learned that we greatly differ in our approach to third world bartering. Just tell me the price, I would say, while she stood beside me rattling off numbers like an auctioneer. 50 rupees, 80 rupees, 60 rupees, 20 rupees. Just tell me how much I would demand. <laughs> this charade culminated in one of my finer humanitarian moments when I turned on a seven-year-old jewelry hawker and screamed in his face, I wouldn't want it if it were free. <laughs> For each of my missteps, the girl recovered with finesse. She made the international sign of crazy to prevent that child from crying. She also came up with creative ways of explaining to waitstaff that in America, puking up food is a sign of respect for the chef. <laughs> And when I was huddled, constipated in the darkness of a wooden bunker with my pants somewhere in the dirt, she emerged like a beacon of hope, wielding her glowing iPhone. You can find this tale and many more on our hit Time Life CD, India's Awkward Moments, featuring the hit single, I took a crap by the light of her iPhone app. <laughs> and other gems like, that's not my nipple, that's heat rash. <laughs> And the timeless classic, Curry in the morning makes me honey. <laughs> Lest you be fooled into thinking that I spent the 12 days of my travel roaming around speaking loudly at people and asking for a McDonald's, I did hold my own. When the girl's morbid medical curiosities emerged in the form of staring and whispering, I would explain to the victims, oh, no, no, she just thought that you were that hot guy from her textbook with polio. We don't have that in our country anymore. Our, <laughs> our budding relationship was much like the developing nation of India itself. You can focus on the unavoidable ugliness or appreciate its beauty. We were stripped of every modern convenience from paved roads to continuous power to shower spouts. But we still managed to find what mattered most to each of us. On the two foot wide plywood bed of an overnight train, we still figured out how to spoon. In a sprint through monsoon rains, we still found our dry senses of humor. 
and in the threatening crush of a human stampede, we both knew that if we had to abandon all of our belongings, I'd still have her sweaty shirt gripped in my fist. You get robbed a million times over in India as they deal in this currency of karma, but there is no price to pay for the calm we experienced drifting down the Ganges with muddied feet and dotted foreheads in the pre-dawn light. Goosh. The cab door shuts again. This time it deposits me at one terminal to return to America and whisks her to another to return to southern India. And just as quickly as we were united, we were separated. The next day, I hurl up the entire trip in a seizing, spastic nausea that leads me crawling to the phone to call my ex-girlfriend for help. And suddenly, it is the two of us sandwiched into a tiny hospital bed, me strung with IV lines, staring vacantly at the white wall and remembering passing slums and rice paddies from the window of a speeding train. My ex is the one to awkwardly receive a flower delivery carrying a message from halfway around the globe. It is addressed to Sugar, a nickname given to me by two little Indian girls who mistook my name for Chini, the Hindi word for sweetener. And it is signed Olive, a nickname I assigned my travel mate based on the town in which she was born. Sending all the good karma in India, it reads. Every person, just like every country, is faced with many moments where one chooses to evolve or to stay the same. It is now July 3rd, 2010. The location is Boston, Massachusetts. India is a spin of the global way, marking its first anniversary of striving toward equality. I am rolling over onto my girlfriend to celebrate a one-year anniversary of our own. I didn't become some master yogi in the aftermath of my journey, nor did I embrace Buddhism and forsake all my worldly possessions. But I say the word India now, and it comes from my tongue like a prayer to some mythic god of change. India. India. We changed together, India, just as you were accepting a new and different expression of love as it spread across your lands. I was kissing new lips in Jaipur and spreading new thighs in Agra and finding new love in Varanasi. We have both navigated the changing and uncertain road since, and we've come out on top. India, I raise my fist to you in unison and thanks. May victory be ours. This American pervert will always be your 